Beloved community, grace and peace to you from the spirit of the living God, the one who delivers good news to the poor and release to the captive and liberation for the oppressed. Whether you are part of First Church, an inclusive and justice-seeking church in the heart of our nation's capital, or whether you are a guest or friend joining us from many different locations, we welcome you to worship on this first Sunday in Black History Month as we explore the theme, the sound of the genuine. Howard Thurman wrote, there is peace that comes when lowering clouds burst and the whole landscape is drenched in rain, refreshing and cool. There is the peace that comes when gnawing hunger finds intimate fulfillment in food, nourishing and life-giving. May our worship be a time when the peace of God attends you, body, mind, and spirit. Today we celebrate communion as our tables become an extension of God's own. Thank you for taking the time to set your table at home with some form of bread and cup, which we will bless and break together. Following worship, we invite those of us joining us by Zoom to stay for our Zoom coffee hour, a time of fellowship with one another. As a reminder, we are currently in phase two of our COVID safety plan, which allows for staff and worship leaders to be present in the sanctuary while others join us virtually. For those present here this morning, please do remain masked, observe distancing, and we invite you to hum rather than sing the hymns. Friends, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome into the shared experience of worshiping the God whose love knows no bounds. Let us worship together, beginning with our opening hymn, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. Once again, our church is observing Black History Month. And when Reverend Amanda suggested that I might do the call to worship today, my first thought was, you really want an old white guy to do the call to worship at the beginning of Black History Month? Uh, and I admit that at times uh, I wondered if the idea of setting aside a Black History Month hadn't kind of run its course. Um, I have been through a lot of Black History Months in my life especially having three kids go through the D.C. public schools. And hadn't we all learned that uh, black history is American history? Hadn't everyone rejected, for example, the false accounts of the Reconstruction era after the Civil War uh, that I had been taught as a kid fail because of the incompetence of the black legislators and the venality of the white reformers? Uh, when research on the subject 
from W.E.B. Du Bois to Eric Foner to Lewis Henry Gates has documented for us the hor horrific history uh, of failed hopes through uh, white violence, oppression, and betrayal. Uh, and we've been engaged here in efforts like the white privilege discussions uh, to deceive, uh, to, to perceive, and to understand the role that racism has played in our own personal histories. Isn't that enough? No. Uh, it seems we need Black History Month more than ever. New political efforts are underway, again, to whitewash the history that is taught in public schools, including universities. We saw in the last election cycle a great deal of nonsense about teaching so-called critical race theory in public schools. Now, by the way, I've been engaged with critical race theory in law schools for 30 years, and really it only stands for the unremarkable proposition that neutral laws can consciously or unconsciously oppress or disadvantage minority communities, and that we need to hear their voices to understand that. The real goal of the current school laws can be seen in a bill backed by the governor of Florida. Quote, an individual should not be made to feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress on account of his or her race. And look, you don't need to be a critical race scholar to understand that this is directed to relieve white people uh, of any concern about our historic legacy of slavery, segregation, economic exploitation, oppressions and lynchings, and anti-immigrant activities, uh, which are inseparable from U.S. history. White people who ignore this are living in a fantasy world and disabling themselves from engaging productively in civic life. Our God is a God of truth. Jesus came not to spin happy, reassuring stories, but to bring people to engage with the actual spiritual and social reality of their own existence and that of their neighbors. In Howard Thurman's formulation, we need to encounter our authentic selves in order to perceive and embrace the authentic selves of others. And this is especially true, uh, perhaps as Thurman saw, across the divides of race or ethnicity. Now, one concern I had in participating in the white privilege discussions was that they would cause me to feel further removed from black people by magnifying the differences in our life experiences. But the opposite has seemed the case. By developing a more realistic notion of my own past and the privileges I've enjoyed, I can respond more openly, less defensively, to the authentic expressions of others, and particularly uh, black, uh, Latinx, and Asian friends and colleagues. God calls us to that work and to those connections. We can build the beloved community only upon truth, a prerequisite for repentance and forgiveness. So let us worship the God of truth. Thank you, Peter. I am very excited that we are uh, reflecting upon the words and wisdom and life and ministry of Howard Thurman this month. Um, he has profound connections here in DC um, as a chaplain at Howard University, as a uh, inspirer of the Church of the Savior. Um, and I have I'm a very proud graduate of Haverford College, and he went to graduate school. He's, I think he's the only person to have gone to graduate school at Haverford, where he studied mysticism and the role of the spirit from Quaker mystic Rufus Jones. So I think upon this month, uh, as we dwell upon it, we welcome the spirit of, of Reverend Thurman with us. We are welcoming us into a, a spiritual reality, a, a deep listening, where God is calling us, draw, closer to God and closer to love of one another. So with that inspiration, I invite you to join me in the prayer of confession adopted from the mystic Howard Thurman. Loving God, 
we confess there's much traffic in our minds and the noise of our own ambition crowds out the sound of the genuine. We cannot hear our own idiom, nor do we listen for the sound of the genuine in others. Help us quiet the heart and cultivate the ability to listen. May the sound of the genuine in all of us make music pleasing to your ears. Amen. Let us have a moment of silence to do the listening. Take heart. Blessed are those who seek the face of God. All who ask, receive, and all who seek, find. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. So now, as we are connected by the God Spirit, let us joyfully pass the peace of Christ with one another. May Christ's peace be with you. Peace. 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 Morning, Lucille. <laughs> to see everybody morning. together and now i invite us to collect our spirits for the rest of worship as we hear the preludium by johann sebastian bach thank you dennis turner
Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures this morning is from the first book of Kings. And this is um, toward the beginning of the stories of Elijah, and King Ahab has just begun his reign of injustice and unfaithfulness. And just before this story, uh, Elijah has said the word of God to Ahab that there will be a drought. The word of the Holy One to Elijah was, Get up, go to Zarephath, which is part of Sidon, and settle there. Watch now, I have commanded a widow woman there to provide for you. And Elijah got up and went to Zarephath. Then he came to the gate of the town, and look, a widow woman was there, gathering sticks. So he called to her and said, Bring me, please, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. She went to bring it, and he called to her and said, Bring me, please, a bit of bread in your hand. Then she said, As the Holy One your God lives, if I had a cake. There was only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. Now look, I am gathering two sticks, then I will go home and prepare the oil and flour for myself and for my child. We will eat it and we will die. Then Elijah said to her, Fear not, go and do as you have said, only make me a little cake of it and bring it to me first, then make something for yourself and your child afterwards. For thus says the Holy One, the God of Israel, the jar of flour will not empty and the jug of oil will not decrease until the day that the Holy One grants rain upon the earth. She went, and she did as Elijah had said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour did not empty, and the jug of oil did not decrease, according to the word of the Holy One that God spoke through Elijah. The word of God for the people of God. The reading from the New Testament today comes from Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 27. Now Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been nurtured, and went, according to his practice, on the day of the Sabbath to the synagogue. And he stood up to read. Then was given him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Most High is upon me, because God has anointed me to proclaim good news to those who are poor. God has sent me to preach liberation to those who are captives and recovery of sight to those who are blind, to liberate those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Most High's favor. Then Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And every eye of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. Then he began to speak to them, saying, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? Then Jesus said to them, Of course, you will all quote me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself, and you all will say, The things we have heard you did at Capernaum do here in your hometown. And Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in their hometown. But I speak truth to you all. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were closed three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet, Elijah was sent to none of them, rather to Zarephath and Sidon, to a widow woman. And there were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Will you pray with me? 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On May 4th, 1980, Dr. Howard Thurman delivered a commencement address at Spelman College entitled, The Sound of the Genuine. He said, there is in every person something that waits and listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. Nobody like you has ever been born and no one like you will ever be born again. You are the only one. I wonder if you can get still enough, not quiet enough, still enough, to hear rumbling up from your unique and essential idiom the sound of the genuine in you. I don't know if you can, but this is your assignment, unquote. Thurman was born in 1899 to a working class family in segregated Daytona, Florida. He was raised by his grandmother, Nancy Ambrose, a former slave from whom he said he caught the contagion of religion. Ms. Ambrose was forbidden from learning to read or write, but she ensured that Thurman would be the first black youth in Daytona to graduate from eighth grade and go on to high school. Of her faith, Thurman said, I learned more about the genius of the religion of Jesus from my grandmother than from all the men who taught me because she moved inside the experience and lived out of that kind of center. Not only did Thurman go on to serve as the dean of Rankin Chapel at Howard University, he also co-founded and co-pastored the first multiracial, multicultural church in the United States, the Fellowship of All Peoples in San Francisco. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is said to have carried at all times two books in his briefcase. One was the Bible. The other was Thurman's slim, potent volume, Jesus and the Disinherited. During his tenure at Howard University, Thurman was among the first delegation of black Americans to travel to India to meet Mahatma Gandhi and learn of Satyagraha, or truth force, meaning nonviolent action for social change. It was a concept transferred from Gandhi to King through Thurman, a testament to the power of sacred encounters to transform lives. For Thurman, the sound of the genuine was not mere suggestion, but an absolute essential for a life of faith. He said, there is something in each one of you that waits, listens, for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if you cannot hear it, you will all your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. In the case of Jesus of Nazareth, those somebodies wishing to pull strings were the hometown folks. According to Luke's gospel, Jesus was baptized, then full of the Holy Spirit, he was led into the wilderness for 40 days of trial and temptation. Our story picks up when, once again, filled with the power of the Spirit, he returned to Galilee and began teaching widely in synagogues to great acclaim. He came to Nazareth, where he was brought up, to do the same. It was the Sabbath day, so he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. There, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Most High is upon me because God has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, and to liberate the oppressed. These words became Jesus' inaugural sermon when he said, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Imagine the scandal 
of proclaiming the ancient promises of God as if they are currently afoot, happening among us now. Dr. Will Gaffney notes that just on the other side of marvel, for that is what Jesus evoked, was this impulse to put this hometown boy in his place. So, they named Joseph as his father, likely invoking the scandal of his questionable parentage, perhaps in front of his mother or other relatives. How quick they were to lay claim to him, to consider him their familiar, to invoke the power of naming him. But Jesus was faithful to the sound of the genuine within himself. He was not deceived by power or thrown off by rejection. Instead, he spoke such searing truth that it incited rage. The kind of riotous rage that infects mobs, driving them to chase truth-tellers out of town. And just as they came to a cliff, determined to push Jesus to his death, he turned. And the gospel account says, he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The sound of the genuine in you might provoke rage, but it can also manifest in a profound clarity of spirit that has the power to settle and bring peace so you can go along your way. The Reverend Dr. Kenneth Samuel once lamented that if we would only learn from Jesus how to handle rejection, we would know how to handle our own. Because no matter how good or good-looking you are, no matter how right or how righteous, no matter your good sense or good intentions, we all experience rejection in life. It's a fact. Rejection says almost nothing in particular about you, but how you handle it says everything. In today's text, Jesus tells a hard truth. Dr. Gaffney puts it this way. Your gifts may not be accepted, welcomed, or lauded by the folk who should be in your corner. There's a great freedom, I think, in knowing that. Noticing it. Then returning to the sound of the genuine rumbling up inside of you as you conspire with the Holy Spirit and go on your way. For the fact that your truth, the truth of who you are and who you are called to be, the fact that your truth may not be received requires an expansion of scope. It will tug you out to the wider world. This is the work of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit is always stepping into the present moment to disrupt life under the falsity of powers and principalities. Dr. Willie James Jennings notes, life under the empire is always life under the threat of assimilation through the weakening and loss of cultural identities and religious sensibilities. Quite the opposite of a life in the Spirit which Jennings describes like this. The spirit has the power to press through centuries of animosity and hatred and beckon people to want one another and envision lives woven together. In the modern day parable, don't look up. The extreme plot line is the point. Our reality has become so absurd, it is beyond parody. A planet-killing comet blazes toward the Earth with a dangerously brief window of time for human beings to intervene. The thing is, no one really cares. Scrupulously busy with endless digital distractions amidst political polarization, infotainment soothed by corporate materialism, the human beings in the film seem nearly as set in their ways as the comet dedicated to its collision course. In one scene, Kate, the astronomy student who discovered the comet, returns home, disillusioned by the inaction to save the planet. 
Her parents cautiously crack the door and from behind a locked screen, her father says, no politics. Her mom adds, your dad and I are for the jobs the comet will provide. Divisions in this country are bad enough, her dad adds. We don't want more of that in our house. At times, it's felt like that in our own families and neighborhoods, hasn't it? Like the only truth that can save us, the truth that we are, in fact, one. All beloved children of God, interdependent upon the earth, this very truth has been maligned and banned and consumed in the fires of conspiracy. Sometimes we look at the ones we've known the longest and can no longer hear the sound of the genuine. It's not easy when simply being who you are provokes rage to turn and pass through the midst of it and go on your way into the wider world. You see, the sound of the genuine in you hungers for the sound of the genuine in others. It is a primal, eternal ache to repair the original rupture wrought by sin. Our ontological unity, which we understand most poignantly in Christ, keeps calling us back to one another. We cannot be fully free until all are free. We cannot be fully healed until all are healed. But this table is where we get to practice, coming together to hear the sound of the genuine in ourselves and in others. This table where no one is excluded, where there is always room, this table that finds us on long journeys into the unknown, even in strange lands with people we've never met, this table that nourishes body and soul. In the final scene of Don't Look Up, little has changed. The comet careens toward the earth and impact is imminent. The corporate plan to save the planet has failed and the powerful are looking for an escape hatch. That's when the impromptu family of scientists and disaffected ones, including an ex-evangelical, instinctually gather around a table for their last supper. They have cooked the asparagus and fingerling potatoes, set the table, lit candles, poured the wine. They share gratitude for life and one another. There's no time not to forgive. Dr. Randall says with a wistful smile, we really did have everything, didn't we? Mindful of the significance of this final meal, but Unschooled in the act of prayer, they aren't sure how to bless the food. Yule, the ex-evangelical, says, I got this. They clasp hands, and he prays. Dearest Father and Almighty Creator, we ask for your grace tonight despite our pride, your forgiveness despite our doubt. Most of all, Lord, we ask for your love to soothe us through these times. May we face whatever is to come in your divine will with courage and open hearts of acceptance. Amen. And then they eat. Even as the table shakes beneath them with the quaking spasms of the comet's impact in another part of the world, even as windows shatter and dishes rattle and doors blow open, they partake. For they have returned to the sound of the genuine. They have befriended the wider world, and even at the very hour of destruction, divine peace is theirs. I wonder if you can get still enough, not quiet enough, still enough, to hear rumbling up 
from your unique and essential idiom, the sound of the genuine in you. I don't know if you can, but this is your assignment. Amen. Thank you, choir. It does not get much more beautiful than that. The spirit is here. For today's offering, I just wanted to share the many ways that we are growing in love this month as we celebrate Black History Month. We want to thank Amanda for kicking it off with a really spectacular sermon that really is calling us to be genuine with one another and boldly answering God's call to use our gifts to make earth as it is in heaven. Next Saturday, there'll be an extraordinary book reading discussion led by Dr. Renee Harrison of Howard University. 
where we'll be discussing her new book, Black Hands, White House, Slave Labor, and the Making of America. We hope you can join us for that. In Sunday school, we, we explored Black History Month as we will throughout the month. This, uh, today, we not only talked about um, communion and manna from heaven, but we also uplifted the, the role Benjamin Banneker had in helping settle the, the city of DC. Next Sunday, we will have our outdoor gathering with our sibling church, the People's United Church of Christ, where we were kicking off a three-week Black History Month scavenger hunt. So think about Flat Stanley and all the different sites that we can find in the greater DC area, maybe including a few boundary stones set by Benjamin Banneker. And tonight we kick off an eight week series called Evening Vespers Following Your Genuine for Our Youth. And, uh, and it's gonna be readings and poetry and scripture and, and each week we are gonna be sharing by a trailblazer adult role model to, who has been following their genuine and, and will hopefully plant some seeds for our teenagers to listen to God uh, in their lives. And tonight they're gonna learn from Elliot Smith who, who works alongside Reverend William Barber in the Poor People's Campaign. We're very grateful for all those who have said yes to this exciting series. So in honor of um, Black History Month, of pursuing and following our genuine, of listening and reflecting and growing in love of God, let us take up uh, today's Sunday offering. And uh, if you are with us through Zoom, the easiest way is to go to our website where you can pay via PayPal or Venco or write a check to the church. Um, if you are here in the sanctuary, uh, there will be a plate uh, upon your uh, exit in the narthex. So thank you so much. And now I invite us to pivot and go to God in prayer. Um, there are several prayers from the community that I would like to lift up. Um, Rose Berman offers prayers for her as she, in two weeks, will be having knee replacement surgery scheduled on February 14th. We pray that she stays COVID free, the surgery goes at planned, and that she heals uh, quickly. Nora Marsh offers prayers for her client and friend, Alpida, who is waiting to find out if she has tongue cancer. Her husband is also having health issues. We pray for both Alpida and her husband. Mary Hayes prays for the people of Costa Rica as it's holding its presidential election today. There are 25 candidates. We pray for wisdom, vision, and peace, and pray for Mary and all her friends and colleagues who live in Costa Rica. Polly Gordon offers prayers of comfort for her client's wife as she recovers from brain surgery and Polly also asked prayers to her friend's family as her brother-in-law was taken off of a ventilator. In Sunday school, Simon Hendler Voss offers prayers for her family, for his family, and his grandfather. So we pray for Simon and Miles, Amanda and Seth, as Seth's dad is facing some serious health challenges. I also want us to lift up prayers for peace in places like the Ukraine, Syria, uh, in cities where there's way too much violence. Prayers for peace and our ability to have civil discourse with one another, that we can truly listen to each other and act on the better half of all of humanity, not just one's selfish desires. I also wanna lift up prayers for our teachers who are going through so much this year. We are leaning on them so much to prepare our children, to help cultivate leaders for our next generation. Yet we hear stories of exhaustion. We hear stories of them being um, attacked for what they're teaching, for their desire to keep themselves or keep their children safe. Um, and we just thank them for their, their commitment, their professionalism, and the amazing strength and heart they've shown to overcome all these obstacles and for their desire to keep on keeping on. So um, for all the teachers out there, um, we pray especially for the teachers of our congregation. We thank them for their gifts and, um, and thank for, for all that they're doing for our children. 
I want to close with, um, uh, to briefly return to, to Howard Thurman's address that he gave to Spelman College in 1980. In the last few paragraphs, he's, he's reminding us to listen to the genuine spirit within us, to drown out all the outside voices, all the outside clatter. Because he says at the heart of it, each of us want to feel that we are thoroughly and completely understood for those times that we can take our guard down to look around us and not feel that we might be destroyed if we have the heart, the courage to be vulnerable, to be completely naked, to be completely exposed, and to be absolutely secure. I think it is the prayer and hope that we live in a beloved community where we can be vulnerable, we, we can feel exposed because we feel safe. We see feel safe by the one who claims us to be beloved, and we, be, we feel safe by a community of those who claim to follow that one. So as people of God, let us continue to embrace the genuine, to know that we are loved by God fully and completely, and to know that so many of the answers we are looking for, the validations we are seeking, are already here within us through God. Amen. And now I invite everyone both here and joining us through Zoom to prepare their table. Beloved community, this morning, each of our tables extends the table of Jesus Christ. And all are welcome to the feast. We come here not because we must, but because we may. We partake not because we are worthy or unworthy, but because we cannot live without God's grace and blessing. This is the feast, God imagines, where beloved community is made real in a simple meal. Will you pray with me? Holy God, you called the worlds into being, created persons in your own image, and set before each one the ways of life and death. When we chose the brokenness of sin, you sent to us prophets and faithful ones. You sent Hagar, who fled abuse and sheltered her son in the desert. By faith, she cried out to you when her child collapsed with thirst and uttered a new name for you. You sent Shifra and Pua, Egyptian midwives who conspired to bring Hebrew baby boys into the world healthy and whole in defiance of a violent authority. You sent Harriet Tubman, Moses of our nation, who carried children through rivers and escaped the barrel of the gun. You sent abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who put oppression to flight. You sent activist Fannie Lou Hamer, who shut the mouths of the powerful and obtained promises. You sent mystic Howard Thurman, who proclaimed the disinherited as inheritors of the city whose architect is you, O oh God. You sent preacher Martin Luther King Jr., who won strength out of weakness, refusing to accept release in order to resurrect justice. You sent Congressman John Lewis, who administered justice and showed us a more perfect way. You sent to us Jesus Christ, your beloved child, and we separated him from you with state-sanctioned violence. He suffered and died in solidarity with all who have known oppression the world over. In so doing, he showed us the way of beloved community that delivers us from the brokenness of sin and death. We bless you, holy God, as together we pray the prayer of Jesus Christ. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So as we break the bread, I invite you to view the service in gallery mode so we can all hold our bread together. And we can all witness the power of celebrating communion as one. On the night of betrayal and desertion and on the eve of his death, Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate the feast of the Passover. He took the bread, he broke it, and blessed it, and saying, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and I invite you to take your cup and let us hold it up together now. He took the cup and giving thanks to God, shared it with the disciples, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then he gave them a new commandment, saying, love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Gracious God, grant that all who share the communion of bread and cup may be one. Send your Holy Spirit on all our tables of bread and wine and on us. Be present with us now as we share this meal. Amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see God is good. For those here in the sanctuary, I invite you to circle up. Let us pray. God, who abides with us and within us, we give thanks that you've refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Christ and the fellowship of that great cloud of witnesses. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth to extend your table to all people 
rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now I invite you to remain standing as we sing the closing hymn, O Sing to the Lord. Please remain standing for our closing blessing. But before that, I want to remind you to check our newsletter website and Facebook page for announcements. If you are a new guest worshiping with us today by Zoom, I invite you to complete the visitor's information form. That link can be found in the worship folder. And next week, after worship, we will offer an inquirer's gathering for all newcomers to learn more about First Church and the United Church of Christ. It will take place after worship on the same Zoom link. That's next week, and all are welcome. That will be hybrid, by the way. Um, a few brief announcements. An email went out on Friday inviting you to sign up for our Lenten book circles. You can choose from a variety of books, all rooted in anti-racism, so please take the time to sign up for that as your spiritual practice in Lent. Friends, on Saturday, as Sam mentioned, we will have a book reading with Dr. Renee Harrison discussing her book, Black Hands, White House. We anticipate that it will be a hybrid event with limited attendance here in the sanctuary while others join us by Zoom. Please look out for that announcement and the sign-up sheet for those wishing to be in person. I want to thank Tom Sowers on sound, Alex Chang, our Zoom moderator, our scripture readers and liturgists, the First Church Choir, and our guest musician today, Dennis Turner. Thank you all for making this service possible. Following worship, join us by Zoom for our Zoom coffee hour, a time of fellowship with one another. The optional discussion question is, what is the best thing that happened to you this week? And now for our blessing. Beloved community, may God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and grant you peace. Go now to listen for the sound of the genuine in you and in others. Amen.